Parliament told Manu Manu land deal files missing. Foreign Affairs Minister questioned on United Nations vote. And PNG's first African appointed judge in the High Court. This is the National MTV News with Mary Bartulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us for Wednesday's news. Lands Minister Justin Chechenko has instructed the Department of Lands Acting Secretary to locate missing files on the Manu Manu land deal. Chechenko told Parliament this morning the former Acting Secretary was suspended because of this deal. He was responding to questions raised by Cairo Kuhiri MP Peter Isoaimo during the question without notice session today. The questions raised by MP concerned Peter Isoaimo were based on the inquiry into the Manu Manu land deal. Isoaimo's questions come two days after the lands minister announced that the files on the Manu Manu land deal and 60 others had gone missing. He wanted to know when a progress report will be produced. Uh, as reported in yesterday's print media and the social media as well, that the controversial uh, Manu Manu Kabadi land files have gone missing. And since he's on top of things, what is his department uh, uh, going to do about this? And when do we expect the administrative commission of inquiry to be concluded and its findings made known to people of Cairo Kuhiri? The controversial Manu Manu land deal involves government decision to relocate the PNG Defence Force naval base from Konidobu, the Mari Barracks and Tarama base from Port Mosby into the central province. A portion of land has been identified involving over 46 million kina. This has raised a lot of questions on how the land was purchased. A commission of inquiry was set up to investigate this. It is exactly one year today since the commission of inquiry was set up and the files remain missing and there hasn't been any reports given on the progress of the inquiry. In response, Minister Chichenko admitted that the department needs to keep proper records of land documents. Chechenko announced that a ministerial instruction was issued to find the missing files. He added that the department is working on setting up a scanning machine to improve its filing system and to ensure that documents are kept safely to avoid files going missing. From the direction of the inquiry from the chairman, we were instructed to produce uh, the title and land files of the Manamano area to them last year. We found immediately the title files, which are with uh, the inquiry now. But unfortunately, we have not found the uh, Manamano land file, which is um, still yet to be found from within our department. This is one of the reasons why the former secretary was suspended, because from our evidence and documentation of facts, he was the last person with it. So the scenario is, is that um, that's where the facts are at the moment, and I have issued a ministerial direction to the acting secretary to go through every filing cabinet, every table, every desk of every officer in the department, which is happening right now, to ensure we not only find that file, land file, but also the 60 missing SABL files. This land deal led to the suspension of two state ministers in the previous O'Neill Dion government and the suspension of two government secretaries. Thekla Gunga, National MTV News. Still in Parliament, Foreign Affairs Minister Rimbing Patu was questioned today by member for Nuku, Joe Sungi, on Papua New Guinea's vote against the United States' decision to place its embassy in Jerusalem. Sungi said 90% of Papua New Guineans are Christians, and the Constitution also states that PNG is a Christian country. Minister Pato responded, saying the vote was not based on Christian principles, but on foreign policy. 
There was a bit of debate on Bible verses today in Parliament. My point of order is this. The Bible verse that he's talking about is general. I'm talking about the Bible verse that is specific to Israel. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member of Nuku, Joe Sungi, questioned the Foreign Affairs Minister on the United Nations vote on whether or not America could place their embassy in Jerusalem and why PNG voted against it. Can we ask the minister to explain to the rest of the population of this country why this country has voted against the very nation that, it's, that it has caught up, that it has a Bible right here with us and we believe in that country because long Bible later we talk about Genesis 12 and 3 and we talk about Samuel who said he supported or cursing Israel will be cursed. Foreign Affairs Minister Rimbig Pato responded saying his decision was not based on Christian principles but on foreign policy. Uh, let me also say that the decision to vote in the way we did was not taken lightly. It was based on professional advice which was received uh, from our mission in New York and also uh, from the department. And it was not a decision based on Christian principles. It was a decision which in accordance with our foreign policy, that is to remain friends of all and enemies to none and we have to the minister also had a Bible verse to further explain reasons why PNG voted against USA. For our nation, we need to look at the, the legal decision of the UN, which has remained since 1967. That is, that Israel must live in peace. And the world, this globalizing world is about peace, prosperity, and security. And we cannot isolate one Bible passage when we must look at everything in their proper context. The Bible itself says, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what the Bible says, doesn't it? The minister said PNG isn't voting against Jerusalem, but against the United States. And the decision we took was not a vote against Israel. Not at all. If you think that it was a vote against uh, Israel, then you have been misled. It was a vote against the United States of America and the position we took was the same position that was taken by some of the closest allies of the United States of America. Athlete Sirox Kari National, MTV News. The issue of ownership of the Oktedi mine was raised in Parliament. Western Governor Taboy Awiyoto raised a series of questions to the Prime Minister on the status of the mine's share certificates and most recent dividends. In my capacity as the Governor, and chairman of, chairman of MROT2, I am yet to receive my share certificate and the dividends for the Fly River Project government. Therefore, my question is, when will be the share certificates be given to the people of Western Province? My second question is, when will we be given our dividends from the 33% equity we hold in West, uh, in Octedi Mine. Western Governor Taboy Atiyoto raised the issue of shareholding for the Octedi Mine in Parliament this week, asking about the status of mine share certificate and OTML's most recent dividend. In September 2017, Octedi had announced an interim dividend payment of 160 million kina to be split approximately 107 million kina to the state and 53 million to the Fly River Provincial Government, CMCA and mine communities. Uh, uh, we have since then uh, inherited a mine that was uh, loss making, making a substantial amount of losses, uh, was virtually uh, employing over close to 3,000 employees. According to Governor Yoto, a climate of doubt still hovers over the payments made to the communities of Western Province, which he will be looking to address during his term. Himmat Shaligram, National MTV News. Works Minister Michael Nali told Parliament Deccanai construction will be sealing sections of the Hiritano Highway. Work is expected to start soon at the cost of 80 million kina. This includes sections between Laloki Bridge and Vanapa and Berena in the Kairukuhiri district. Minister Nali announced this when answering questions on the deteriorating road conditions in that part of central province. A road along uh, Hiritano, uh, Hiritano uh, 
highway starting from uh, uh, from Nine Mile or Laloki Bridge, Igolo Kerema, is uh, is been uh, taken care of. Uh, Lovanapa, Igolo Berena, Igolo Kerema. Uh, contract has already been awarded to Dekanai uh, for 80 million kina. It is. Um, uh, performance-based contract, then uh, they can I will be on the road for four years to make sure that there is no pothole and blockages of uh, drainage and kind of stuff. So that part has been taken care of. Uh, Lola Loki, Iko Long uh, Vanapa. Uh, we've had uh, the department is having meetings as I speak with the World Bank, and World Bank has agreed to pick up that section of the road. So tenders should come on uh, very shortly. So. Uh, the Hiritano section of the road has been, uh, has, has been uh, uh, taken care of. Still in Parliament, some members of Parliament today sought clarification on the local level government elections. Western New Britain Governor Sasindran Mutuvel led the way during question time. Governor for ECPIC also questioned the election process. That suppose uh, all presidents shall resign law, sign up law, open election. How all by come back and long sit down the provincial assembly. So this lay me cause him confusion. Some of the presidents blow me plato. I'll bring him this la copy blow quota then. Natak sabe all time. I'll to buy deserve la come inside long assembly. So me like uh, intergovernment relations minister and by clarify him this la honourable house. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With the national general elections for council presidents expected to be in July, the Minister for Intergovernment Relations, Kevin Isifu, made it clear that if a president is going to run for office, he must resign and the power be handed over to the deputy council president. The secular that went out before the elections by the previous minister, Honorable Leo Dion, uh, it still stands. And the secular states very clear that if you didn't resign and you stood for elections, even if you don't resign, you have deemed to have resigned, which means you will no longer come back to the office. And the law states clear that uh, the deputy president automatically takes over as the president. East Sipic Governor Alan Bird then questioned the Prime Minister to further explain if there would be any changes made to the LLG elections. As uh, Chairman of the NEC, what his intentions are in relation to changing the elections process for Council Presidents? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister Pete O'Neill responded saying if any changes were to take place, it would be after the elections and the province will have the choice on how the elections would be conducted. Any changes that may be contemplated, uh, those changes will be happening after the elections. Uh, there is no point in uh, creating uncertainty in the minds of uh, our people right throughout the country uh, whilst, whilst the elections process is taking place. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have uh, also decided that uh, election of council pres presidents, either by the people uh, LLGs directly, people in the LLG directly, or by the ward uh, councillors, uh, will be optional. It's up to each individual province uh, to decide which option that they take. There are provinces in the country where uh, they want, they wish to have the council presidents elected by the people. Uh, that is fine. And there are other provinces where they want the ward councillors uh, to elect the president. So we will uh, allow the options to the provinces. Adelaide Sirox Kari National, MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. African judge appointed. Lawyers urged to utilize mediation process, fuel price increase, and hella budget passed. Those stories and more when we come back. Welcome back to the news. Justice Wangile Dingake has been sworn in as a judge of the National and Supreme Courts. He is the first African to be appointed to Papua New Guinea's high courts. His swearing in at Government House today was witnessed by Chief Justice Salomo Injia and fellow judges. His appointment brings the number of judges to 44. Chief Justice Salomo Injia, together with fellow judges of the National and Supreme Court, were at Government House today for the swearing-in of Professor Wangile Dingake as a judge in Papua New Guinea's National and Supreme Courts. His appointment is a first for the judiciary, 
with Dingake, the first African to serve in the country's high courts. His appointment is for a period of three years. Do promise and declare that I will well and truly serve the independent state of Papua New Guinea. According to Chief Justice Salomo Injia, Justice Dingake will begin his tenure by assisting Justice Hitelai Polume in the state claims courts. Uh, more immediately, he will be, uh, or he has been assigned to sit with Justice Hitelai Polume in a special court track called the State Claims uh, Court. That court uh, specializes in handling claims by and against the state. Given Justice Dingake's extensive experience in the areas of human rights, he is also expected to preside over some human rights cases as well during his term. It's historical for Papua New Guinea in the sense that this is the first time a judge <coughs> from the African continent has been uh, appointed uh, to the bench in Papua New Guinea. He has special experiences in uh, human rights, dealing with human rights violation cases. Being new to Papua New Guinea, Justice Dingake is keen on assisting the country's courts in dispensing justice, especially given the similarities between the jurisdictions in Botswana, where he is originally from, and Papua New Guinea. My prime interest is on human rights. And human rights, as you know, are universal. I have the occasion to uh, read up uh, the constitution of Papua New Guinea, which entrenches uh, human rights, the rule of law, and the independence of the judiciary. Uh, some values that uh, we share, uh, both Papua New Guinea and Botswana. So those are similarities, and I hope I'll be able to execute my duties as faithfully as the oath of office requires. Justice Dingake's appointment brings the total number of judges in the high courts to 44. And according to Sir Salamo, whilst there is a need for more judges, budget cuts to the judiciary in this year's budget is a hindrance to recruitment. Fuel users will pay more for petrol, diesel and kerosene as of tomorrow. This follows the announcement of maximum retail prices for the month of February by the Independent Consumer Competition Commission. Petrol will now be 3 kina 54 toya per litre, an increase of 7 toya. Diesel will be 3 kina 20 per litre, an increase of 11 toya. And kerosene will be 2 kina 92 toya per litre, an increase of 11 toya as well. According to the IEEC, the increases are a result of import parity prices for this month, as well as an increase in world oil prices over the past month as well. The new rates come into effect tomorrow. Mount Hagen resident Judge Justice Kenneth Frank urged lawyers to use mediation services. He said this today in Mount Hagen at the opening of the 2018 legal year. Members of the Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary and Correctional Service also attended the event. Justice Kenneth Frank encouraged lawyers this morning in Mount Hagen to maximize the use of mediation service that are available to everyone. He said lawyers must be skilled to dispose cases to mediation to be able to serve their clients and the public. Justice Frank said mediation training is available and interested judges, magistrates and lawyers must attend the course to gain knowledge to handle alternate dispute resolution or ADR to resolve conflicts and disputes. Against those figures, the second half of last year, on average, we have one case per day. Currently, there are 851 criminal cases pending at the Mount Hagen National Court. There are also about 1,000 civil cases that need to be resolved. Mount Hagen National Court disposes only 136 cases last year. Justice Frank said the numbers of matters that are disposed are equal to the number of matters that are coming to the courts. He said even though there are three resident judges, they are not able to do all the work. Uh, assist in the uh, disposition of cases to mediation. 
Justice Frank urged lawyers to work closely with police to get evidences and witnesses to court so that matters are fast-tracked. He said ADR or mediation is an alternate way to achieve timely and effective outcomes. Mediation helps by bringing disputed parties to a round table to explore disputes and enable disputed parties to address their problem and come to an understanding. Secure and preserve for the people and pastor to their care. Our three Fascinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. Intergovernment Relations Minister Kevin Isufu says his ministry will be working towards giving financial autonomy to selected provinces. Minister Isufu was in East Britain last Friday to discuss with provincial leaders on the possibilities of turning over financial powers from the national government to the East Britain provincial government. East Britain, New Ireland and Morabe have been putting their hands up in this quest for financial autonomy. The quest for financial autonomy by various provinces in the country isn't new. East New Britain, New Ireland and Morobe have long been calling on the government to free up the financial powers. Last Friday, the Inter-Government Relations Minister, Kevin Isifu, had a roundtable discussion with leaders of the East New Britain Provincial Assembly, an aspiring province that wants to control its own revenue. The call for financial autonomy by provinces gained a momentum shortly after the granting of the Bougainville autonomy. While the Bougainville autonomy is of political nature, what other provinces are asking for is economical powers. This means provinces that will be given the financial autonomy will have total control over their revenue rather than sending it to the central government coffer at Waigani for distribution. Master Isifu says his ministry will be making submissions to the national government so that selected provinces can control their own finance and build their own economy. New Island province has also been calling for a financial autonomy to control its own revenue. The former Prime Minister and New Island Governor Sir Julius Chan have also shared similar sentiments after coming to a realization that the wealth generated from the Liir gold mine never go back to redevelop the province. Morobe province has also joined the quest, prompted by its unprecedented economic growth in recent years. But it is a huge task ahead for the national government to decide before allowing the functions of financial autonomy to be implemented. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. In a bid to eradicate tuberculosis on Daru Island in Western Province, a fully equipped van to screen patients suspected of TB was delivered. The van houses systematic screening equipment, which includes digital X-ray and diagnostic equipment, the first in the country. World Bank representatives were on Daru this week for this occasion. Since 2014, the fight against tuberculosis in Daru has gained traction. This has seen local health facilities, non-government organizations and volunteers partnering to eradicate TB in this part of the country. According to Technical Officer for Western and NCD, Dr. Sonia Majas, there has been some improvements in the approach taken to treat TB patients in Daru. We're actually moving forward to a new initiative and that is the systematic screening initiative wherein we will screen the whole island of Daru and we will get to know who are the ones who are affected by this disease and so we can enroll them for treatment and that's where we stop the transmission of TB. Despite being a TB hotspot, improved access to proper health care has enabled rate of infection to decrease from 30% to 1%. But authorities here are aiming to totally eradicate TB and according to Dr. Tawhid, Islam early detection screening is important in TB treatment. This is why Daru has become the first center in the country to receive a TB screening van. Uh, tuberculosis is not a disease that we can control and we can limit it within a very short period of time. So a sustainable effort needs to be there. A, a strong, resilient health system needs to be built. And we believe the new journey, this is the third point, the new journey which is happening today, that the population screening, this is the way to go uh, here. We will find the active cases and at the early stages, which will essentially cut the transmission and which will have a very good impact. The arrival of this van was witnessed by a visiting delegation as well as other partners. The van is a boost for TB treatment with equipment that will now be used by people to be tested for TB and prescribed medication immediately. The health department was also present with Dr. Paisen Dakulala, 
commending all stakeholders involved in the fight against TB in Daru. To cut the long story short, we are here to declare war on TB and end TB out of Daru Island as a start. Kick TB out of Daru and eventually kick TB out of the province and this then translates into kicking TB out of Papua New Guinea. It's an opportunity for each and every citizen of Daru to have access to the health care that they need and that they deserve. So use the TB entry point to make sure that not only tuberculosis but every other health challenge you face that everybody in the population benefits. With the arrival of the screening van, authorities are confident they are one step closer in eradicating TB in Western Province. Godwin Eki, National, MTV News. The Hela Provincial Assembly has passed a budget of 325 million kina for 2018. According to the governor, Philip Undialu, the budget is specifically targeted for capacity building, especially in the areas of law and order, education and infrastructure development. Governor Undialu says while other funding remains parked in trust funds, work must begin to improve services. Other budget cuts include roads, electricity and upgrade of Tari Airport. All members of the Hela Provincial Assembly were present to witness the passing of the budget in Tari. Here with National MTV News, PNG's health services rated low by the World Bank. That story and more when we come back. Welcome back to the news. World Bank PNG launched the second part of the economic update of delivering better value from public health spending today. The update aims at analyzing recent key economic developments and provides an in-depth examination of a selected development issue. Country manager Patricia Vivas Carter says that good quality health services and delivery is a necessity in all centers of the country. Why invest in health was a question Program Leader for Human Development World Bank Group, Aparna Somanathan, answered in her report this morning. She stated that 50% of PNG children suffer from malnutrition and the readiness to deliver services is extremely low and unreliable. So service readiness is particularly weak at the low level, the critical frontline level. And underlying all of this is a decentralized health system that has led to very complex and fragmented mechanisms for allocating and using funds. Budget allocation and spending decisions are made by a multiplicity of agents. According to the World Bank reports, public spending on health in the country is higher than other countries that have similar gross national income per capita. However, many of PNG's health outcomes are far worse than countries with similar income levels. So Manathan says that if this continues, it can result in a shortage of human resource. The PNG government also needs to start thinking about the sequencing of any transitions from donor systems to government financing to ensure that service, there are no breakdowns in service delivery or any loss in, in capacity during the transition. Chief Executive Officer of Millenbay Provincial Hospital, Billy Nighy, completely agreed with the report. He says that the focus is too much on implementing the National Health Plan and not so much on delivery and service. One of the challenges that we actually are going through, and I could continue to say this, uh, in the health system we are basically about, we account for 30% of the issues that directly affect us and we try to deliver a service. Uh, much of the uh, issues actually uh, we need as support. Executive Manager for Strategic Policy Division from the Department of Health, Ken Y, stated also that the government has placed so much focus on improving infrastructure and the health service delivery is failing. The challenges that we have been facing, and uh, I do concur with the CEO for um, uh, Mill Bay, uh, what he has expressed is what is actually seen on the, on, on the ground. Um, service delivery um, needs to be strengthened right at the aid post level. We have about 3,600. 
Lilian Supera Kinea, National MTV News. Yesterday, the Morabe governor responded to calls by students for the Morabe provincial government to pay outstanding fees under the Gerson Sololu scholarship, but he stopped short of giving an exact date for the payment. He said, however, that institutions will be given letters of guarantee so students can be admitted to class. Frustration has been building over the last three weeks, stemming from the governor's absence and the delayed response to their concerns. Many of the students on the scholarship didn't have the school fees paid last year and demanded an increase in the scholarship budget from 4 million kina to 10 million kina to cover the cost. Morbe Governor Ginsen Saonu said the provincial budget is being screened by Treasury Department and an increase in the scholarship budget is still uncertain. However, he said institutions would be given letters of guarantee in order for students to register and attend classes. Saonu said he has not received or cited reports of outstanding scholarship payments from the provincial scholarship offices since the introduction of the policy 10 years ago. With the concern raised, the administration has appointed a new scholarship committee to monitor the scholarship program. The governor assured the students that the administration would open a new trust account to have money available early next year for the scholarship program. The students attend 23 tertiary institutions and colleges in the country, but only eight institutions are included in the scholarship program. The students have called on the provincial government to include the other 15 institutions in the program. Morbid students who wish to apply for the scholarship program will use both online and manual registration to apply. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. In July 2017, International Container Terminal Services, a port management company based in the Philippines, secured 25-year contracts for the management of the Port Mosby and Lay Wharfs. Today, in Parliament, Governor for Northern Province Gary Jufa raised concerns over the agreement, citing the company's history of labor rights violations at terminals operated by ICTSI in other countries. The company is based in Philippines and has a terrible track record around the world in the way it treats its workers and the way it actually pushes out local businesses that are operating in the stevedoring industry. According to information from the unions, the International Trade Workers Federation and the unions within PNG that are responsible for these areas, these workers, it is asserted that more than 1,000 jobs, Papua New Guinean jobs, will be lost as a result of this decision to engage this company. Last year, International Container Terminal Services signed an MOA with the impacted community landowner groups in Leh. This agreement also establishes a collaborative framework in support of the port project in Leh. The landowner groups, AHR Investments Limited and Labu Holdings Limited, will each have a 15% share subscription in ICTSI's subsidiary, South Pacific International Container Terminal Limited. Labor will also be sourced from landowner villages. Minister of State-Owned Enterprises, William Duma, responded saying that the company is globally recognized and that Jufa's figures were not facts. You are a leader of this country. When you make statements, be responsible. Don't present statements that are based on innuendos and rumors. They are facts. They are facts. Facts are going to yourself. But Mr. Speaker, this is a company, company, this is a company. Minister Duma said that the decision was not done overnight, but took three years with careful deliberation. It was not an agreement that reached within months. It, it took more than three years, even before my time as minister. That was a process that was started when the former minister was minister responsible for state enterprises. It went through a public tender. Mr. Mr. Speaker, We've all experienced the performance of our own, very own state-owned state -owned enterprise, including Ports Corporation. The inability to provide a decent return for our shareholders who are citizens of this country. And Ports Corporation is no exception. Himmat Shalagram, National MTV News. The founder of a small tailoring and design company has expanded her business to train women in Lay City. 
Heather Vanua says she began teaching women to sew when she was doing a master's degree in management. When her studies ended, there were so many requests for training that she turned it into a small business. These women are learning a skill that is in high demand. The trainer and founder of Nivan Tailoring, Heather Vanua, began teaching women how to sew as part of a project she was doing for a master's degree a few years ago. It's the life, the joy, the smiles in their face, the change that they, they experience. When she completed her master's program, she found that she couldn't stop because other women were sending requests asking for help. But I kept receiving like emails, like 10 emails a day. And, and then I thought to myself, what would happen if I stopped you know, teaching other women? From Port Moresby, she's brought her skills to lay. In this week-long workshop, she's teaching women how to design, measure, cut and sew dresses. The training has also awoken innovation and the entrepreneurial spirit in the women. Many are now talking about developing their own pieces for sale. Lena Kusak is a nurse who's also attending the workshop. She is using the training to add to her prior knowledge. <laughs> some up in dress, but once you master the skills, you can use that drafting skills law, like anything that you can, but you have to master the skills, the drafting. Heather Vanua is now looking at expanding her reach with the increasing demand for the training. Scott Wade, National MTV News, Lay. You're with National MTV News. The PNG Hebo Baramandi is prepared for the ICC World Cup qualifiers. That's coming up next in Trukai Sports. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. We begin with cricket and the Hebo PNG Baramandis will leave for Brisbane for the training camp on Friday. Head coach Joe Dawes spoke to MTV about the preparations before heading to Zimbabwe later this month for the ICC Cricket World Cup qualifiers. We've got a couple of games in Brisbane um, next week, so We've got some gym program, we've got some net sessions, and then that's built in and around two games. So uh, we've got some games with that are bringing some players in from interstate, some good local second 11 players from, from the Queensland setup, and then also the extras from our squad. We're taking a big squad to Brisbane. So we're going to have two good games there, two good tough games at Valleys, my old club, which I'm looking forward to going back to. Uh, boys will come home for five days and get to spend some time at home with their families before the big trip to Zimbabwe and we go back to Brisbane for three or four days before we fly out and play another game then as well. To tennis now, the Pacific Oceania Federation Cup team has made a brilliant start to their Fed Cup campaign after defeating Iran. Papua New Guinea's Abigail Terry Apisa and Samoa's Steffi Karuthas are back in the squad for the fourth consecutive year, while Carol Lee from the Northern Marianas will make her second appearance for the team. The pairing of Terry Apisa and Steffi defeated the Iranian opponents 6-love-6-love, six love, six love, while Dilys de Goy and Carol Lee won in their singles match respectively. Later on this evening, Pacific Oceania will play Oman in their second pool match. So good luck to them. Trukai Sports continues. After these messages, we will have some news on the Winter Olympics. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. The Winter Olympics and African athletes are naturally going to be unusual. And Akwasi Frimpong's story is extraordinary. He grew up in poverty before finding a better life in the Netherlands. However, he's never forgotten his roots and will be representing Ghana at the Games. Akwasi is the second Winter Olympian ever from Ghana. And the first in the sport of skeleton. But life was not always an exhilarating ride. We struggled a lot as a family. Uh, we lived in a really tiny home with my grandma, Grandma Minka, where she took care of me with about 10 kids in a really tiny room. We worked really hard as a family together. Even though it was really tough for us, we always seemed to have a laugh on our face 
uh, joke around as a family, support each other. Uh, one of the things I was always looking forward to was Christmas. It was the only time we actually had a full egg or a full Coca-Cola bottle. One of the memories in Ghana definitely was um, was me actually being around in the neighborhood, um, uh, trying to be an athlete. We always found a way to to make sports very cheap, uh, just find whatever we call the kick, you know, if it was a bottle or anything like that. You know, we didn't really have a soccer ball. Wanting a better future for her children, Akwasa's mom left Ghana when he was three years old. She kept her promise that after she finds a better place, a job, she'll come back for us. So in 1995, uh, when I was eight years old, my mom came back to Ghana and we moved to the Netherlands. When I moved to the Netherlands, um, I became part of uh, track and field. I was recruited uh, through PE classes in school uh, by my coach. And um, I actually uh, received from him a golden shoes, the Michael Johnson golden shoes, golden spikes. Um, and then I won the 200 meters uh, at the junior uh, championship at 17 years old. And um, that's where they started calling me Golden Sprint. I you know, started to dream more and bigger. And, and my biggest goal was to make it to the Olympics. And in 2012, uh, I got really close. Um, I had a tendon injury, um, so I couldn't really represent the Netherlands. From there on, I got recruited to get into the snow sports. Our head coach of the bobsled team said, what do you think of trying bobsled for the Netherlands team? And I was like, are you kidding me, black men on ice? Not for me, right? And, uh, and definitely I remember uh, the movie of Cool Runnings, Jamaica, and I thought if they can do it, uh, maybe there's a chance for me as well. His former coach suggested that Skeleton would be a good fit for the former speedy sprinter. You know, I discussed that with my wife and she said, you know what, I don't want you to be 99 years old and still whining about your Olympic dreams, so let's do it. So I went November 2015 to Park City and did a tryout to see if I even liked it because I wanted to make sure I liked it, not just for going to the Olympics, and I loved it. And MTV will be airing the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics this Friday at 9 p.m., followed by an hour of highlights in the coming days. And that ends Trukai Sports. We'll have for you the weather details when we return. Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux. Celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. A look at the weather forecast over the next 24 hours in the southern region. Port Mosby fine becoming cloudy with a top of 30 degrees. 30 degrees as well for Daru and Kerma with some showers. Mostly fine for Alatau and Popandeta. To the Momasa region, some showers expected in Leh and Wau. A shower or two for Medang and Wiwek and a shower or two as well for Vanimo with a top of 28. To the New Guinea Islands region, Lorangao, Kebian, Kokopo, Rabao, Kimbe and Buka. All these centers can expect some showers over the next 24 hours with a top temperature of 28 degrees. And in the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Nendi and Wabeg. All these major centers can expect mostly fine weather over the next 24 hours. To a look at the forecast for small ships, but first there is a strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of the southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Kerama, Yule Island, Hood Point, all the Millen Bay Islands including Finchafen through Vitya Strait, Siasi Island to Long Island to Medang, Bogia Uibak, Aitape and New Guinea Islands as well as the Bismarck Sea. Waters of southern Pinji Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Kerama, Yule Island, Hood Point to Samurai Island, seas 2 to 3 meters. Waters of eastern and western Milan Bay Islands with waters of Finchafen to Vitya and Dampier Straits to Siasi Island to Long Island to Medang, Bogia and with waters of New Island to New Britain and Bougainville, seas 2.5 to 3 meters. Waters of Samurai Island to Cape Bogle to Finchafen, seas 0 0.5 to 1.5 meters. Waters of Bogia to Wiwek, Aitape, Vanimo and the northern PNG Indonesian border, seas 1.5 to 2.5 meters. And waters of Manus and its western group of islands, seas 2 to 2.5 meters.
and a look at the ocean forecast for PNG areas. Coral Sea sees rough with northwest to southwesterly winds at 25 to 34 knots. Solomon Sea sees light to moderate with northwest to southwesterly winds at 10 to 20 knots. Bismarck Sea sees rough with northwesterly winds at 25 to 34 knots. And the Pacific Ocean sees moderate with westerly winds at 15 to 20 knots. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And that's the way it is this Wednesday, the 7th of February. On behalf of the MTV News team, pleasant viewing. Good night.